Hey, 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 everybody. Great to see all y'all out there in Son of Sam Landa. Uh, hey, uh, we got a great one for you today. And what are we doing? Well, welcome to part three of the Berkowitz apartment letters. Yes, yes. And what is the Berkowitz apartment letters? Well, this is a new series and uh, actually we're almost done. We probably have just one more episode left, maybe two, but probably just one where we just look at Berkowitz's apartment letters uh, without all the other fluff and pomp and circumstance. We've looked at these letters in Psychiatric Sunday. We've related them to his Abrahamson letters. We've looked at these letters in relation to the Breslin and Borelli letters. We've looked at these letters in all sorts of ways, but we never actually just sat and read all of them. And that is what we're doing in this series. So welcome, everyone. Great to see all y'all out there. We got all the stalwarts in the chat right now. The gang is all here. So actually, a couple programming notes before we continue on today's uh, today's little journey here. Um, we're coming into quite a few. Um, we're coming into quite a few shows in the next couple of weeks um, for just in the next few days. Uh, right now it's, uh, June 21st, 2023, of course, welcome to the first day of summer. And, um, so we'll be looking at Charles Hamilton, uh, a Maury's so-called handwriting expert on the next show. We're going to be looking at another vindication, uh, in the latest, uh, killer tape podcast, huge information has just come out while well, vindicating one of our, one of our, <laughs> our most massive and uh, original um well theories hypotheses in the series and that is that berkowitz found the names of his victims in the phone book and of course we'll be doing that on i believe on saturday i'm trying to get bill badgley from the from the uh from the um killer tape podcast to join me and he has expressed interest. We're just trying to work out the details. And that show might end up getting postponed uh, either a few hours or a day or something like that. But anyway, we'll figure it out. And then we are, are starting. And it might be at maximum two episodes. But we probably can get it done in one. We're going to be looking at Richie. Richie Sparaza. Yes. And who is this shadowy figure named Richie Sparaza? Well, he was one of the few people that Maury outright named as being a member of the 22 of course which never existed so he couldn't be a, you can't be a member of something that never existed <laughs> so it's like so so we're gonna be of course looking at this guy well who was he what was his reputation how did he know berkowitz what was their relationship like uh we're gonna be dealing with issues like was he the second getaway driver at the netto shooting was he involved in Son of Sam with David, Disco David Berkowitz? So anyway, we're going to be doing that. Um, and I might split that into two episodes. We'll see how it goes. Anyway, so we got <clears throat> quite a bunch but bit to do today. Oh, yeah, we're working on uh, Freund. Uh, John Catalano Book Club and I are working on a, a, a show on the Christine Freund shooting. Because as you know, what we're all trying to do at this point in the in the game is just vacuum up all the last stories that there are, all the last outstanding issues that there are, all the little uh, little to big stories that are still extant in the Son of Sam saga. And uh, and that's what we're doing. I didn't realize there was so much that we still needed to get to when I uh, ceremoniously ended the main portion of the video series several months ago. But it turns out that not only is there a uh, quite a bit left to look at, but there's also an audience for it as well, which is great. So it's great to see all y'all back again. All right. So listen, we got quite a bit to do, to do today. So we are just going to get started with what? With the apartment letters, the Berkowitz apartment letters, part three. And of course, throw anything in the chat that you guys got uh, you want to say. Hopefully I'll see it. If I don't, uh, and it's very important, just write it again. And I'll try to answer any questions you have and all that kind of stuff. So, of course, part of the... Um, part of the uh, purpose of this video series is not only to, well, to show you all this information uh, that's out there that exists um, and show it to you in a way that makes sense, that's hopefully uh, educational and hopefully entertaining as well. 
But also one of the things I like to do is, well, teach you in this video series. And of course, all of these, these uh, letters are there for you to study and peruse on your own. They're all in the uh, <clears throat> in the Queen's DA files. And if you have any questions like, what's the Queen's DA files? What is the Queen's DA? What's that? What, what are you talking about? Well, go look on my site for a, uh, a video called um, How to Navigate the Queen's DA or something like that, where I teach you where everything is, how to download, how to study, how to research. Because again, we need... A, a new we're this is this, we're in the new paradigm of son of sam right we have we've we're beyond the cult story we realize that that whole thing is just historical fiction or as og rubes likes to say mmb more mori bullshit right um as ray j says the evidence the morons won't look at and that's actually about very true um one of the things that's really shocking to me again because when this queen's da stuff came out i thought that the the waters were going to part everyone was going to be friends the lion would lie down with the lamb and all that kind of stuff but it really wasn't to be what i found and what a lot of people on on um you know on the side of reality found was that uh, the morons went deeper into their shell they put their heads further into the sand. They just absolutely refuse to face the reality, which is that in this Queen's DA dump, there is absolutely zero evidence, zero, 0.00% 0 .00 evidence that there was a cult involvement in Son of Sam. And let me tell you something. As you all know, I was once one of the biggest morons out there. People think that I started this video series as a ruse. I originally came in and pretended to be a Maury fan in order to in order to trick people with who I didn't even know existed at the time. <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous, right? But no, I started out this video series as one of the biggest Maury Terry fans there was. And um, well, but I guess that I'm just me and my fans were just different, a different breed because we we, we were able to update our operating systems once new information came in. So uh, all of these letters are letters that you can easily look at, research on your own, but we're going to go through them together. And uh, as I like to do, we're going to relate them historically to the crimes and we're going to parse out any interesting passages that may come up. And again, quite a few of these letters were not part of our discussions about the Borelli and Breslin letters and the apartment wall and all that kind of stuff. So in that sense, they're new. All right, let's get started, shall we? Letter number one, Samuel Carr, destroyer of persons, destroyer of life, of dreams, of love, of hope, and of peace. Samuel Carr, cruel, mean Sam and his screaming maniac, that ugly, howling blood monster. God, how my head hurts from his piercing screams. I must kill for John Carr. <laughs> that terrible rapist and child molester uh, you should hear john about his perverted conquest that terrible john carr born to ruin people there is no peace on earth and samuel carr my master rules yonkers and soon wants to possess the bronx and queens god help those people because sam and john have the power to drive people crazy who has the knowledge with which to combat the face, the forces, those terrible evil forces of the Carr family of redacted Yonkers, New York. So anyway, of course, this is where Maury got his bullshit thesis that John Carr was actually really a child molester and a rapist because not only did it because it right another strong piece of evidence linking Sam Carr, John Carr to the son of Sam case. It was the discovery that Carr dated 13 to 15 year old girls in Minot. At least three friends, including Tom Taylor and Frank Head, reported this proclivity. In the Breslin letter, John Wheaties was called a rapist and suffocator of young girls. Moreover, in a note left in an apartment and dismissed by New York authorities, Berkowitz referred to Carr as, quote, terrible rapist and molester. You should hear John boast about his perverted conquests, Berkowitz wrote. But the accurate clue was ignored. First of all, how is that accurate? When we, when John Catalano and I listened to the, uh, <laughs> listened to the tapes about John Carr, there was no mention about him dating 13 year olds. Phil Falcon was like the dude didn't even talk to girls. This proclivity of John's never existed except in except here. 
<laughs> except right here, right? Rapist and child molester. And a deluded note in Berkowitz's apartment, which of course, Maury Terry, right? He doesn't, he doesn't give us the whole note. He just talks about the note here. And a note left as an apartment and dismissed by New York authorities, right? He, he writes dismissed by New York authorities as if New York authorities were supposed to take this letter here seriously, right? Another thing we're going to learn, by the way, guys, in our in our uh, next episode about vindication is uh, another little passage in, in the latest Killer Tape podcast where Berkowitz clearly says straight up in, in, in no uncertain terms that he didn't know the cars. He never met them. He, he didn't know them. OK, and we're going to hear that in his own in his own words. I want to thank Paul Hart, of course, for finding that for, for me today. So Maury Terry once again does the whole like <clears throat> let's let let's allude to a letter but not show you the whole thing. Let's just put in one little sentence and then let's make up other stuff out of whole cloth that never actually happened in North Dakota and then let's tie it together in some bullshit little little uh, uh nice neat package, right? This is how this is the reality here. There was the there was the the John Wheat car listing in the phone book for John Carr and Wheat Car, Berkowitz, <clears throat> who who found this name in the phone book. Okay, absolutely historical fact at this point. He found the names in the phone book. That's what our next vindication is going to be about. Okay. So he found John Wheat in the phone book. He thought John Wheat was one person. So he originally called him in his crazy letters, John Wheat Carr, right? He didn't know that it was two people, clearly didn't know them. And it was Johnny Rape Slayer. That was his first troll of the guy. He didn't know the guy. He just called him Johnny Rape Slayer, just like he called Sam Carr, first Lieutenant Tinker, right? And he called Jack Cassara, General Cosmo, right? His nickname for John Wheat Car was Johnny Rape Slayer. And then by the we, by the uh, by the Breslin letter, by the time the Breslin letter comes around, it has evolved into John Wheaties, rapist and suffocator of young girls. So Maury Terry took this to be historical fact. He actually believed that John Carr was actually nicknamed Wheaties and that he was really a rapist and suffocator of young girls. And of course, it all started from this delusional letter right here. OK. All right. The best research. The phone book. Derek Larson. MMB. More Maury bullshit. That's right. And Moet. Johnny Rape Slayer. Circle Jerk in the Pipe Band. All right. <laughs> so, Moet, you're going to like this one. This, this one I'm specifically reading from Moet. The people of redacted Yonkers are the meanest, cruelest people to ever live. They only have one goal, and that is to hurt, maim, and destroy and or kill the people of the Glenwood section of Yonkers. Their sadistic, vicious, and brutal assaults upon innocent people of the community cannot be allowed to continue. For the love of God and all humankind, we the people of Yonkers must unite against these deadly foes and destroy these parasites before they spread. <laughs> The people of Redacted are detrimental to the health, peace, and well-being of the people and are preventing the citizens of Yonkers from enjoying good health and the partaking of the pursuit of happiness. This is why I demand from the police as a citizen and taxpayer an end to the reign of terror that these people have instilled on us. I want everyone in Yonkers to be able to enjoy the things that God has given us, the singing of the birds. The trees, the fresh, cool, refreshing breeze that blows in from the Hudson. I want the people of Glenwood to be able to walk the streets without fear of murder, to be able to open up their windows at all hours and get fresh air instead of having to shut them for fear of the Wicker Street Gang. I beg the police to act now and rid Yonkers of these people. And if they do not act immediately, then we, the people of Yonkers, will have to kill these parasites ourselves because we want to be free. The people of Redacted have assaulted me and have caused me grievous bodily harm. They have attempted to kill me because they know that I am a threat to their beastly way of life. I hereby confess to the mass murder of the members of the Wicker Street Gang. Via the use of my shotgun 
And as God and Jesus Christ are my witnesses, I hereby in the names give it the people of Yonkers a chance for a new and better life with peace and goodwill toward everyone. Yours truly and most sincerely, David Richard Berkowitz, David R. Berkowitz, 35 Pine Street. So it's like, yo, uh, I want to make love to the world. I love people. I don't believe belong on earth. Return me to yahoos, to the people of Queens. I love you. This guy's always talking about people. He's always about the people. He's loving the people. Disco love the people. I mean, this is ridiculous already. So wait, so John, okay. So John Catalano, what did he say? So they're going to jump on you because Tom Taylor said John hung out with young girls. I guess that means he raped them. A uh, good point. So Tom Turkey also <laughs> also said that John Carr did the son of Sam symbol, but he had to be told what it looked like first in order to remember it. He said it, John wrote it in small letters. Darlene said it was in big letters. They had no clue what they were talking about. They were bombed out on drugs. They didn't know anything. They were complete wasteoids. So, um, Tom Taylor, his word, uh, I don't know. And even and even if John Carr hung out with a 13-year-old girl one day, it doesn't mean that that was his proclivity and that he did it all the time. And it certainly, as John Catalano just said, it certainly doesn't mean that he was a rapist of them. It's like everybody knows the cars, right? <clears throat> it's like everybody's an expert on the car family. Oh, yeah, Sam. He beat his family. He locked everyone in the closet. Sam was terrible, mean and cruel to the people. Meanwhile, Wheat says that he was like a nice guy. I mean, you know, look, I mean, the simple fact is Sam Carr didn't have the greatest reputation in Yonkers. Let's just put it that way. I mean, I can't, I can't bullshit about that. But it doesn't mean that he... um. It doesn't mean that the dude was a beating his family and that he locked John and Michael in the garage or in the attic or whatever, right? Like everyone is an expert on the car family. And it's just like we don't need we don't know these people. People. People of the world say ho. All right. So let's carry on. Man on a leash. So this is actually like a weird, like. I don't know what this is, actually, because it says man on a leash and there's a little drawing here. I'm not quite sure what it is. Is it a poem? Is it a short story? Is it a I don't even know what it is. Man on a leash. It is 7 a.m. I've been ordered to get up, but I'm so tired. God damn you. Get up, Mr. Berkowitz. Please. Ten more minutes. I've only had two hours sleep. God damn you. Get up, Mr. Berkowitz. Oh, man, I'm so tired of fighting. When will the war end so I can sleep? Oh, my God, it's 7, 10 a.m. and the alarm has been sounded again. What? The Russians have blown up a deli on McLean Avenue. Oh, Jesus, please stop the war. Shit, it's 7, 18 a.m. and I've just gotten word that communist infiltrators have just blown up a Volkswagen full of nuns on Lake Avenue. Oh, Jesus, please, please stop the war. It's 7.28 a.m. and I'm up and ready. I'm waiting for the warning sirens to sound again from the general's headquarters at Redacted. 7.31. Here it comes. The howls have signaled another attack. A gas station on Central Park Avenue. Wait, what's this? No, continued warning barks. It must have been a double hit. Yes, a Yonkers policeman's brain has just been splattered all over Midland Avenue. A sniper, obviously. Dirty commies. It's 7.45 in a.m. and I'm tired and hungry. I wish I could get some shut-eye, but I'm a soldier and soldiers can never sleep. However, if I did try and sneak some sleep and I was caught in the act, I'd probably be shot because the general at Redacted wants all his men awake. He never lets us sleep, lest the commies should sneak up on us and cut our throats. So that's kind of crazy, <laughs> right? Um, so Dave Moth actually says here, wasn't, didn't Wheat say Maury was kicked out of the car household from an inappropriate comment he made? Yes, that's actually, um, I don't know whether it actually happened, but that's true that Wheat has said that. She not only said it to me, she said it to several other people. 
And so the story goes um, that when they were teenagers, Maury Terry was at their house at a party of some sort, made some sort of inappropriate gesture. I'm not quite sure whether this see the story changes. And that's what gets me a little bit, you know, not so sure that it actually really happened. Like, I, I got to be honest. I think in one story, Maury was said something to John Carr's girlfriend and another story, he said something to Wheat herself. But the upshot was that he got that Sam heard it and kicked Maury out of the house and he was forever banned from the car house. And therefore, that was the beginning of the vendetta against the cars. I don't know that to be true. I was not there. I'm just reporting what we what Wheat said. Um you again it, you guys i'm not gonna vouch for the veracity of that the only thing that i can really say that for sure about weed is the things that i actually have in my hand that are tangible the pieces of evidence okay everything else is just a he said she said and i have no clue what's true all right so anyway this this letter is actually quite uh instructive or this this missive or whatever the hell it is first of all one of the things I want you to realize about Berkowitz and and Lorenzo brought this up on our in the comment section of one of our latest videos, the dude could write. He was an excellent writer. He had intelligence. He had great command of the English language. He knew how to turn a phrase. He was wordy. He was witty. Yes, he was urbane. <laughs> right as they uh, so so that's the first thing i want you to i want i want to put out there so he was per, of course perfectly capable of writing the borelli and breslin letters the second thing i want you to notice is um this letter out of all of them in my opinion is the closest to the vibe of the breslin letter uh i know that it's kind of weird because it doesn't look like the breslin letter it doesn't sound it doesn't have the same words but there's a vibe about it and if you read this out loud to yourself, because I got this right when I was just reading it to you guys, okay? And if you read this out loud to yourself, it actually has a rhythm and a and a feel of the Breslin letter. Um, so again, uh, he, but no, <laughs> Manny, <laughs> he had help. He he. He didn't write the Breslin letter. It was a committee. Uh, they all got together at his house and, and dictated it to him. And then he maybe he wrote it. Uh, uh, all right, maybe it was in his handwriting, but he it was dictated. The f out of here. It wasn't dictated. The dude wrote it himself. Who dictated it to him? Give me a break with this crap already. Um. Oh, that's right. They dictated it to him when they were right before they all went out to the diner and, 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 and in a loud voices, even though they all could speak in tongues to each other, according to Perlman, in, a, in loud voices at a random diner on, I think on 10th Avenue, Wheat Car was discussing murder in front of, there just happened to be a, a confidant of Perlman there. G-T-F-O-H. There was no Perlman. Did Perlman even who the hell was Perlman and didn't even he even exist? I mean, at this point, we have to ask these things about Maury Terry. Like, <laughs> was he was he just literally making shit up? Because we already know that he wrote the anonymous so-called letter to himself about Andrew Dupay. That was in his voice. It was in his typewriter. It was obviously written front by him. So he made up a letter. I mean, he he made up a lot of stuff. And so did he make up the um, the Perlman character that we talked about as well? So, yeah, it gets ridiculous. And that's why this is so much fun to do, because at this point, all of this Maury Terry stuff is only worthy to be made fun of. It's not it's not worth to be taken seriously. It's only there for fodder for com for comedy for you <laughs> for me to make fun of to you guys. So anyway, interesting, interesting uh, note to the Nazis at redacted Yonkers. I wonder what makes people like you. Uh, that didn't make sense. I cannot imagine what animals you are and why I. 
Sorry. Why I are you del deliberately trying to hurt your fellow human beings? What have we, the people, done to you for you to turn on mankind and try to hurt innocent people? Have peep the people of Yonkers treated you so bad that you thirst to see us destroyed? Do you wish for us all to die? How many people's lives have you damaged or ruined? How much pain have you invoked on the people of Glenwood Yonkers? How many families have been torn apart? How many have, in states of hopeless and... and Sorry, anguish and despair, committed suicide, and because of you, the people have redacted. I tell you this, you shall not escape. You shall be punished for your sins, for your wickedness, and for your cruelness, and for your attempts to kill your neighbors via your sadistic and torturous acts. So, Moet, once again, the people. So, this dude just loved talking about loving people on how people of the world were great and how the people and this and the people that people <laughs> just people it's ridiculous <clears throat> this guy has so many tells there is at this time all right so this is a letter that he wrote to craig glassman actually okay and this is a, actually a fame has a famous a famous line in it which is those of you who are son of sam heads it's right here Okay. There is at this time, you'll recognize it. Okay. There is at this time little for you to gain by loyal service. I believe the end of the reign of terror is, is near and the authorities will deal with you in their own way. I guess I'm foolish to plead with you to surrender and turn to God because I know that your soul is evil and that you have no heart. Therefore, you will have to spend eternity in the lowest depths of hell. Don't fear because Captain Carr and his family and me will be at your side. You have done well in your 6,000 plus years of service. You have taken over my soul despite my early resistance and my denials of early realizations. Go ahead if you must and continue to torture the people of Earth. Don't stop issuing Captain Carr's wrath on the world at my pleas. Just go ahead, you cruel monster, and continue your torments. Then you will stand naked at the judgment seat of Christ. Deso Demeshmutz. So, um, wow, Franz Marx is back. Whoa, haven't seen that name in a while. So, uh, <clears throat> so yeah. So what's interesting about this is actually that Maury, I believe, and uh, used this letter, and he... He said that that Burkowitz was talking about himself here. I believe that the end of the reign of terror is near, that he was talking about himself and his own and his own um, son of Sam crimes. But that's not true. If you put this in context with a letter that we read earlier, there was another thing where it said reign of terror. Hold on right here. Uh Anyway, it, it says it in one of these letters. I, I don't want to go back because it's it's. I don't want to kill the flow of the show. But in, I've read Reign of Terror in one of these before. So the context for what he means by Reign of Terror is here. And it doesn't mean anything what, what, what Maury said about... He wasn't talking about the Son of Sam crimes when he said Reign of Terror. Okay? And what's interesting here is that 6,000 plus years. Wasn't Harvey the dog supposed to be 6,000 years old? Right? Wasn't that what he told people or I don't people of the world. And now, now every time I say the word people, it's like, I, it's, I can't say the word people anymore. Uh, so anyway, 6,000 years. And so poor Craig Glassman, right? He, dude gets divorced. He has to move into this new apartment. His wife stays in the old apartment on Glenwood Avenue. He moves into apartment 6C. He's got this great view of the Hudson River. But Berkowitz is his upstairs neighbor. I mean, geez, talk about luck. So this guy Berkowitz, of course, became obsessed with Glassman. And we are going to, that's what our vindication on Saturday is going to be about, uh, when we, where we talk about the latest Killer Tape podcast. And yeah, he thought that Craig Glassman worshipped the devil. He was talking about everyone worshipping the devil. And of course, all the morons are like, yeah, <laughs> Craig Glassman. <laughs> involved 
Craig Glassman was not involved in the Son of Sam. The dude helped the police capture the guy. He was sickened by this guy. He was getting letters from him. The, but Berkowitz lit a f- arson fire in his front door. Please. And then there are, and there are people going, oh, yeah, <laughs> Glassman faked his death. Get the hell out of here with that bull crap. Anyway, I just got in touch with Shayna Glassman again. I asked her to like, because our, our, the last time we tried to um, get together, it was a disaster. She, she, I don't think she's going to get together with me this time either. So I'm not worried about what I say. But um, she was like, oh, yeah, I can't go on your show because my publicist says my book's coming out. And, and uh, I can't do anything before the book comes out. Meanwhile, it's been a year plus since that time. There's been no book. There's no there's no even an inkling of a book. So I figured, all right, let me try to break the ice with Shana again and um, and get her on the show because I want to actually talk to her about her dad and Glassman and, and his story and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, she has not returned my my emails and I, and I don't expect her to. All right. So that was the Glassman letter. All right. Here we have another letter. Eat my dork, says Sam to his mother. Eat my dork. In Sam's house, his kingdom's heathendom, there lies no peace. It is a house of death. Jealousy prevails in this world because certain people who are now alive cannot eat any more pussy of the dead ladies. However, the worms are truly feasting and freely nibbling on sweet dead. Where is Sam now? He is eating rotten flesh. There are many old homes in the yard, old bones in the yard, sorry. Those who have long since passed away are too innumerable to mention. But don't go prowling around because Sam's mother, the harlot, uses those to sharp those bones to sharpen her teeth, and she will be very inhospitable to you. She might even chew your bone. <laughs> So a couple of things about this. This is a, a this is a gold mine. Okay, first of all, Berkowitz is sick. I don't care if he was faking these letters. If you're not a sick person, you can't fake a letter like this. Like if you're spiritually healthy, right? If you're not spiritually sick, if you're not insane, if you're not like mentally unwell, like if it, it, it'd be very hard for you to write a letter like this. In fact, I would say like I can't write a letter like this. It would come out. It wouldn't come out as sickening. Like I just I don't know, right? So like even if this was fake and he was feigning insanity, like they like to say, um, it's still a very sickening and disgusting imagery and and, and thoughts. But this letter is a gold mine for many other reasons. First of all, he's talking about the bones in the yard, right? From the Borelli letter. I didn't even realize that until I just read this now. Okay, I could have used this to prove he that he wrote the Borelli letter. But l- notice about all this eating, right? Nibbling, sweet dead, eating flesh, eating, nibbling, worms, free feasting, right? Um, look at the beginning of the Breslin letter. Hello from the gutters of NYC, which are filled with dog manure, vomit, stale wine, urine, and blood. Hello from the sewers of NYC, which swallow up these delicacies when they are washed away by the sweeper trucks. Hello from the cracks in the sidewalks of NYC and from the ants that dwell in these cracks and feed on the dried blood of the dead that is seeped into these cracks. So notice the similarities, guys, right? It's all about eating, feasting, nibbling, dead, sweet, right? And it's all over here, sweet, dwell, right? Feed, dried blood, delicacies, swallowing. Oh, but I forgot. He had help. All right. So moving right along. By the way, moving right along. Anybody remember? This is like, again, showing my age. Anybody remember the movie, the Muppet movie from like 1979, 1980? There was a great, uh, the the Rainbow Connection. That was a great song, right? Uh, How did that go again? Uh, Why are there so many songs about rainbows? 
to the other side. Right. That was actually a great song. But um, there was a song on there called Moving Right Along, and it was sung by Fozzie the Bear and uh, Kermit the Frog, and it was a great song. <clears throat> Moving right along, do 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 do, foot loose and fancy free, do 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 do. All right, just had to say it. All right, on Wednesday, April twenty seventh, nineteen seventy seven, Francis Carr ignites terror in Yonkers. At 7.55 a.m., Fat Francis the Lesbian unleashes the That Howling Maniac, the Blood Monster. A quiet neighborhood is destroyed. Francis is the queen of the demons, and she, with her cold, loveless heart and soul, ruins the lives of the people. God help us and protect us from the Carr family before we are all driven mad. Oh, God, I'm going mad. Why, Sam, do you hate people so much that you let loose that terrible monster upon the people? They say that noise drives people crazy. Maybe it's true. And Sam Carr, you are evil. So, of course, uh, I was very curious about this date, Wednesday, April 27th, 1977. I So I went to the Internet and I went. Uh, and typed in April 27th, 1977. What day of week was it? And in fact, it was a Wednesday, Wednesday, April 27th, 1977. Now, what does this mean? I have no idea, but it, 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 it means that he got an accurate date on one of these letters. Um, did he go back and backdate it? What did he write this on April 27th, 1977? Uh, who knows? But remember, April of 1977 was a serious month in the history of David Berkowitz. Okay. First, and of course, the then his victims. April 77 was a monumental, was a monumental month. He shoots, he shoots the car dog. I think he even sends a Molotov cocktail in the cars, although that might have happened another day, another month. He kills Alexander Esau and Valentina Suriani. He leaves the the um the Bor the Bor Borelli letter at that scene. And he's writing all these letters. So a April 27th, 1977, right? So he's writing these letters in April. There was another one that I believe he wrote in April as well. So April 77 was a, was a serious month in this dude's head. All right, so let's carry it on. And this is our last letter. Today's not going to be that long a show. But don't worry, guys. We got three shows coming up, and they're going to be blockbusters. We're going to work. You're, you're going to be totally sick of me by the time. We're all done. And then that's just the beginning. I'm going to be do doing a lot within the next couple of weeks. All right. This one I've actually had known several times on previous shows because it's it's quite interesting. And why? Because, well, we'll see. For Craig, all the Hitlers, all the evil kings, all murders and monsters who have been cast into the fire from eras before are shouting with joy and greed at every new victim that Craig acquires. Death and destruction, terror and havoc, blood and bullets, the horrors of hell. More milk. <laughs> so anyway, what does this remind you of? And those of you who are with me, been with me for a long time, you know, you know what this reminds you of. But for those who are just joining me for the first time, and there seems to be a lot of new new names coming on board. Well, it's the sign off of the uh, Breslin letter. Blood and family, darkness and death, absolute depravity, 44, right? Same cadence, same rhythm, same vibe, right? Dude was practicing. He was evolving. Now, of course, the Son of Sam symbol is controversial. Oh, John Carr wrote it on the back of a telephone book in Minot, North Dakota, months before... Okay, this telephone book, uh, is it in the room with us now? I mean, give me a break, guys. This You're getting that from Tom Turkey, a drugged out wasteoid who couldn't remember what, what shoe goes on the right foot. And then you're getting his story as told to you, filtered through the lens of the drunkard, the user, the not good friend, the manipulator, the riddle teller, Maury Terry, right? Like, so it's being doubly filtered, one through a drunken, a drugger, a, dr a drugged out heroin addict, right? Pill addict, acid head, weed head. 
and then filtered through a drunker and a user and a not good friend. I mean, so you're going to, so you're going to believe that I, I sorry, I don't believe it. Per Berkowitz was perfectly capable of looking on the cover of Occult Bondage and Deliverance by Kurt Koch, a book he said that he had plenty of influence from, that he owned and read. And if you look at the cover of that book, it has all of these symbols there. He loved drawing X's. It was his whole thing. And then, of course, then we have the two Craig is Craig letters, right? Which had the symbol the symbol, but it was reversed, right? And here it is again. And what's interesting, and I did a show on this, but it's been taken off the air. There's actually two Craig is Craig letters. If you if you look at these two letters, they're not the same. They they are they're not in the, they're they're the same handwriting, but they're not the same. They're not written the same. There's the the, the, the it's slightly different, right? They're same words, but different. Um, slightly different stylizations uh the symbols drawn differently it's flatter here it's more wide here and open right and all that kind of stuff the uh the angle of this arrow is different from the angle here and so on and so forth so he was um he was uh practicing these letters and practicing these symbols and Maury used this right oh you would Maury said oh you would think the son of Sam would know his own symbol no he was just practicing it and he was evolving as time went on this was probably a, you know, an earlier or later version of it right and then of course this Craig is Craig letter yeah I know John Carr wrote it right it was a poem that John Carr wrote about Craig O'Connor well first of all what proof of that do we have do we have of that happening at all? And second of all, we already know that Craig Glassman lived below um, Berkowitz, and he was obsessed with Craig. Right? We already saw several letters in the in today's show about, about Craig. Right? So it's getting ridiculous. Maury Terry is freaking uh, circle jerking the pipe band. <laughs> I mean, just, just get out get, GTFOH with this crap already, guys. So um, anyway, so I think that that is pretty much it for today. Um, I feel sad. I kind of want to do a much longer show. Let me look and see whether there's anything in the chat that I missed. Uh, oh, bah, bah, bah. I'm just looking here. Is there anything I missed? Anything I missed? Uh, Maury was equally as spiritually sick. Yes, I agree. I don't know. I don't know who you're comparing him to, but yet I agree. Um, anyway, so yeah, so you guys are, you guys are all here with me. So let me just think, uh, so Franz Mark says here, I do think if Maury had not written the book, we would not be looking at this case. He did keep it relevant. Um, I agree. Yes. He, because he started this whole thing about the cult, right, which got us all hot and bothered, and created this whole Son of Sam world, alternate reality of Son of Sam, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, if he hadn't written the book, yeah, Berkowitz would have definitely been forgotten, as he is amongst most people in the world. I mean, let's face it. I mean, I only have thirty-eight people watching this show, and I'm the most popular Son of Sam show on, in the world right now. So it's not like this is a huge. Um, <laughs> a huge story to, to this day. Uh, it's just the heads. It's just us, us people who are interested in it. But um, yeah, if Maury didn't do it, didn't, didn't write the book, we wouldn't be knowing about it. But then again, uh, do we really need to know about all this stuff? I mean, I enjoy it. You guys enjoy it. It's our fun pastime. I suppose we enjoy diving deep into this. But the world doesn't need any of this stuff. Um, so, you know, Maury did commit a major crime against uh uh, against the world, against the people of the world. And that was writing that book. It was such a book of fiction, such filled with lies and distortions, manipulation and abuse. And uh, unfortunately, to this day, people, um, pe some people of the world are still falling for it, but they're morons. I mean, they're never going to learn. And so in, in a sense, it's like we just need to move on from them. I mean, let, let them have their delusions. So it's, it's totally cool. 
So, all right. Anyway, uh, Rita Scott says we all need to go di disco dancing at, at peach trees. We need to go circle jerk in the pipe band while disco dancing at peach trees. All right, guys. Well, listen, I want to say thank you so much, everyone out there. This was a fun little show, but we're, we're going to end it here. I'll catch you all in a couple days when we're going to be talking about Charles Hamilton, Maury's handwriting expert. Spoiler alert, birds of a feather flock together.